Welcome everyone to Lighter Footprint's second event for 2023, the Land Gap Report with Dr. Kate Dooley. My name is Ray Peck and I'm your host for this evening. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we live and meet tonight. I'm on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country, otherwise known as Hawthorne in Melbourne. We honour and pay our respects to elders, past and present. Our event tonight, I, I think, could not have been better timed. Yesterday, it was the International Day of Forests, and forests are under threat, as we know, from land clearing and climate change. And the climate pledges of many countries involve forests and plantations. The IPCC's sixth synthesis report was released yesterday. Now, the projected pathways in the report's graphs assume country climate pledges are possible and kept, and many of those are land-based. And here in Australia, we have the safeguard mechanism under review, which currently allows carbon credits and offsets, again, many being land-based. So it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Kate Dooley, lead author of the Land Gap Report. Kate is an interdisciplinary scholar with expertise in climate mitigation and land use policy and governance. She received her PhD from the University of Melbourne, where she's currently a lecturer in climate change politics. Kate has policy expertise on forest carbon accounting and forest governance. She has almost two decades experience in advising government and non-governmental organisations on the intersection of forest governance and climate policy. Kate has published extensively, including on forest carbon accounting rules, illegal logging and forest governance and human rights and equity and the role of science in shaping climate mitigation pathways. Late last year, I heard Kate speak so eloquently about the Land Gap Report on the Land and Climate Review podcast. I was impressed by the importance and implications of the report, so I tracked Kate down. Lighter Footprints is delighted that Kate accepted our invitation to present the report findings to us tonight and answer our questions. Uh, about this publication, the Land Gap Report, which um, was released uh, last November, just prior to the UN summit COP27 that happened in Egypt. And I've divided the, um, the presentation into three topics. So I'm actually speaking about a little bit more than the Land Gap Report. So starting with the science and what I'll talk about here is actually the science of land-based carbon removals. You may have heard of something called CDR, carbon dioxide removal. And this is part of the whole net zero framing. So I'll just explain a bit about the science of that because it then helps to... Um, understand why the findings in the Land Gap Report are important. And then the second part of the presentation is um, the Land Gap Report. I'll present the findings and, and what we looked at there. And finally, some, um, some brief comments about policy, climate policy in Australia. Um, and I just wanted to start just to say a little bit more about the IPCC report that was released um, effectively yesterday in Australia, late Monday night. Um, for people who haven't seen much news about it, you might have to head over to um, The Guardian or SBS or somewhere non-Murdoch media controlled, uh, but it is a very, very important report. And um, you may have heard, I've, I've heard a lot of the media framing saying the last warning for humanity. And just to explain what that is, this is the final summary report of a seven-year scientific assessment cycle. So the assessment cycle starts again Um or the end of this year, really, so next year. And it will be seven years until that cycle is completed and all of the um, reports are collated by thousands of scientists to get another summary report. And by the time we're there, we will well and truly know whether we can limit warm, whether we're going to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. In seven years, we'll either be on track to meet those goals or we'll have blown it. And that's because this decade is so critical for climate action. So it really, really is an important report. And um, I encourage people to um, look at some of the media around it and some of the analysis. 
of what it's telling us. And uh, actually quite a lot of that will come out in this presentation as well, or the key, the key points. So firstly, this all starts with the Paris Agreement. Um, this, is, these are the, this is the globally agreed climate goals that we're trying to achieve. And the, the climate goals in the Paris Agreement are to limit warming to well below two degrees and aiming for 1.5 degrees. I'm sure everybody knows this, and this is what we hear a lot of. But what we also hear is that uh, to do that, we have to we need net zero by 2050. So from governments and companies, from everybody, we're getting this net zero that is saying they'll go net zero by 2050. And does that actually mean anything? And where where did it come from? So what I actually looked at in my PhD was how this was framed in the Paris Agreement. And this is actually the line. So it doesn't say net zero anywhere in the agreement, but in this Article 4.1, it does say that we need to balance anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks in the second half of this century. It actually also says before that in line with the science. So the science in terms of what's just been released from the IPCC predicts exactly, uh, dictates or defines when, um, when exactly this balance between emissions and sources needs to be achieved. And that's where we get the net zero by 2050, because effectively there'd be net. While there'd be emissions going to the atmosphere, removals would balance them out, and so it would be net new emissions to the atmosphere. So what this does, and what my research is on, is terrestrial sinks, land-based sinks, forests, that kind of thing, is it puts, um, the, so these are called sinks, that's why there's the word sinks in the text. It puts these sinks into the centre of the main objective for how we achieve the Paris Agreement. Now, in contrast, if we, uh, hang on, I went backwards. If we go to the back to the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, so that was the previous agreement that bound um, rich countries to reduce emissions. It was actually very similar language is in the Kyoto Protocol. And there was a lot of difficulty getting this language achieved in the Paris Agreement, like how to frame the sentence. And I think in the end, they sort of defaulted to existing language. But the Kyoto Protocol talks about net changes in greenhouse gas emissions by sources and removals by sinks. So basically the same language. The difference though, and this difference is critical, is this was not the main objective of the Kyoto Protocol, net changes in sources and balancing the net changes in sources and sinks. This was Article 3.3. It was the very, very controversial article reduced literally at the 11th hour to bring forests and sinks into the Kyoto Protocol and many countries, in particular the EU and um, what's called um, SID, Small Island Developing States, were furiously against this because the objective of the Kyoto Protocol was to reduce emissions from fossil fuels and other industrial processes. And it wasn't about whether we can remove some of those emissions by sinks is really neither here or there in terms of how we address climate change. So this is a massive change that from a side, and also you can see the rest of the language, the sinks are limited to afforestation, reforestation since 1990. And then there was a whole rule book about how those sinks were counted, how they're limited. Now sinks are just smack bang in the main objective of the Paris Agreement, no, lim no limits, no rule book, very, very concerning. And now we have companies and governments coming and saying, I'll be net zero by 2050, but they think they're just going to do that by maybe only reducing our emissions a little bit or not reducing at all, and then removing those emissions, um, drawing them out of the atmosphere through sinks. So this is not was not the intention of the Paris Agreement, it was just bad wording and it was a difficult agreement to get up and running. So it's important to understand that. Um, now I want to go th quickly through three points around why these carbon removals don't balance those ongoing emissions and why the IPCC report that just came out, for example, was crystal clear that we need to urgent rapid reductions in actual emissions starting immediately uh, and not and it's not about netting out emissions with removals. So the first point is that it is cumulative emissions that drive warming, so emissions that accumulate in the atmosphere. And if ongoing fossil fuel emissions are allowed to be added to the atmosphere, that increases cumulative emissions, even if you're removing them by sinks. That might sound, that might not sound right. You just think emissions up, emissions down, balanced. But if you go back to the carbon cycle, so looking at this figure here, Emissions from fossil fuels, I mean, they're called fossil fuels for a reason, right? They have been locked away, their reservoirs um, of fossil fuels locked away for millennia. Um, and they're not part of the active carbon cycle. They're not in the atmosphere unless we drill them up and burn them and put them in the atmosphere. Whereas separately, you have the active carbon cycle, which is atmosphere, 
um, land, I can't see exactly what that says, it doesn't matter, but it's like land, soil, forests, vegetation, and oceans. So atmosphere, land, and oceans is the active carbon cycle, and carbon is always moving between those three things. So if you pull carbon, if you move carbon from permanently locked away fossil fuels, put it in the atmosphere, and then pull it into trees, it's not permanently locked away. It's still in aggregate, there is more carbon in that carbon cycle, and it will move from the trees and land back into the atmosphere in short timescales. So removing carbon into trees does not compensate for, um, oh, sorry, keep going backwards, does not compensate for burning fossil fuels, different processes in the carbon cycle. That's the first reason. The second reason is, Delay requires greater removals. So this is um, a graphic that was from the 2018 IPCC report on 1.5 degrees. It was all the same information. It's all summarised into this latest synthesis report. And it's four illustrative pathways for net zero. So the interesting thing about these pathways is the, the bottom line, the zero, but it's not the bottom, bottom line because the, the graph goes negative, but the black horizontal line, that's that's the net zero. So we're aiming for emissions to be at that or, or the emissions above the line and emissions below the line should balance out to net zero. So removals below the line. So what we have in the first pathway, P1, is very steep, immediate, rapid reductions in emissions and a very small amount of removals from um, AFALU is actually forests, growing forests, basically, land, land and forest measures. Um, and then in P2, P3, P4, you see how emissions don't reduce as rapidly and therefore we need more removals below the line to achieve the net zero. So those removals are just... Um, compensating or offsetting for the emissions that haven't gone down as quickly as they should. And if you get to P4, um, so the yellow is, in addition to these forest removals, um, BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is basically growing lots of energy crops instead of food. Well, I, I suggest it would be instead of food because I've done the analysis on how much land. Actually, it's the next slide, so we'll get there in a minute. So, okay, we're growing energy crops instead of food, burning them, capturing the carbon and putting it underground so that we can continue fossil fuel emissions. So the IPCC report that's just come out was very, very clear that these pathways, P2, P3, P4, are high risk, or at least P3, P4. They come with high risks to people, biodiversity. Um, so the more we delay reducing emissions, the more we need these removals, the more risky and um, bad impacts that will be, which I go through in a few of the next slides. Um, don't worry about this graph. Don't have to understand it. Um, the horizontal bar is the axes and there's a zero in the middle. So we've got negative and positive, negative to the, I don't know which direction you're looking at it anyway. There's a negative sign in front of those numbers. What it's showing is how much land use change is in those models, um, these ones I just showed you, how much land use change this yellow and brown requires to remove those delayed emissions from the atmosphere. Um, energy crops, we have, um, so, and this is in million hectares. So a thousand million hectares, it's actually about 1,200 1, um, million hectares. So over a billion million hectares of additional energy crops for removing that carbon. Now, current global cropland area is 1,300 million hectares. So like doubling global cropland area, which actually the models don't do. What they do is reduce area of land used for, to grow food while we're increasing this area for energy crops. Also a huge increase in forest land, which might sound good, but probably not if it's monoculture forests, huge biodiversity, water pollution impacts. So a billion hectares more energy crops, a billion hectares more forest land, reduced pasture land. These are really, really, and this is the upper end of the scale. This is this P4. Um, I mean, the whole range is shown in that graph, but the upper end is, is the where the line ends. Um, that's the range. So huge impacts because of these huge land use change, but the other that would be required to remove carbon from the atmosphere. But the other thing to understand about land use change, and I'm sorry, you probably can't really read these, but um, if you do get the slides, the little bullet points are interesting to read. And just if you look at the headings, these are the direct drivers to biodiversity loss. So this is... Um, this is categorized in many biodiversity um, research papers. There are five direct drivers. There are many, many more indirect drivers. Our whole um, consumption-based and um, Western lifestyles are indirect drivers. 
But the five direct drivers are um, climate change, invasive species, pollution, resource extraction, and changes in land and sea use. And the leading driver of biodiversity loss is changes in land and sea use. So land use changes what drives biodiversity loss, yet we're proposing to potentially have huge amounts of land use change to remove carbon from the atmosphere because we didn't reduce fossil fuel emissions quickly enough. This is from the International Panel of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So they released a big groundbreaking report in, I'm pretty sure it was 2019. Yes, it's on the slide. Um, and there was a very interesting analysis in there where they looked at those pathways that I showed you before. So they looked at P2, P3 and P4, those three pathways. These come from the IPCC, they're modeled mitigation pathways um, with varying degrees of BEX in them. So this one P2 is, is obviously the best. It reduces emissions as fast as um, those particular pathways say they can do. P1 is um, is sort of outside that framework and, and uses well, it uses um, a lot of energy efficiency and technology advancement to um, drive emissions down more quickly. Anyway, so P2, the best of those um, three sort of dangerous pathways, when they analysed that, they still found that it drove biodiversity loss. So this is biodiversity here defined as species rich, richness, material, nature's contribution to people and regulating nature's contribution to people. It used to be called ecosystem services, if people are familiar with that terminology. Now in the new reports, ecosystem services is basically relabeled as nature's contribution to people. Um, okay, so material doesn't go down because that's resource extraction. Oh, sorry. But um, regulating, that's like water services, water, forests, um, atmosphere, all of those sort of regulating services of nature, as well as species richness, go down even under this um, P2 pathway. And we're not on track for this pathway, by the way. We're sort of looking at P3 at this stage. So this is, for, I find this just really, really concerning. Like we can't be relying on land use change to solve we can't be relying on land to solve climate change and in the process make the biodiversity crisis worse. These two are obviously linked. Biodiversity loss contributes to climate change and it's also essential for a habit habitable planet uh, maintaining ecosystem integrity. So the issues are linked. Final slide on the science and we'll have to go through the rest more quickly. Um, so this is a paper I did last year with some colleagues at the University of Melbourne, and we modelled, okay, what if we just did really good, what we would call good ecosystem restoration globally, and see how much carbon that can pull down, and so it's sort of limited, so there's not negative impacts, we don't have a thousand, a billion hectares of energy crops or any energy crops at all, it's just restoring um, existing ecosystems basically, which is effectively the new goal of the um, Convention on Biodiversity. We still found we could remove a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, it's it's sort of 370-ish gigatons of CO2 over the century. This timeline is the whole century. Um, and that's about the mid-estimate of all the papers that are estimating how much carbon we can remove just from land um, land options without using BEX, without using that bioenergy option. But what was really disturbing is when we then modeled this in a, in a climate model that looks at the temperature impacts and along with really, so basically that P1 pathway, the pathway that, that had no BEX emissions reduced as quickly as possible when we included our removals in that pathway, the removals have uh, no impact on temperature by 2050 or barely any impact, it's 0 0.01 degree. And that reason for that is really simple. And this is also reflected in the, the synthesis report that came out yesterday is that it takes a couple of decades for removals to scale up and we're likely to hit 1.5 degrees uh, in the 2030s. So there isn't time for um, removing carbon from the atmosphere to reduce the temperature threshold that we're going to hit. The only way to um, limit warming to 1.5 degrees now is not putting those emissions in the atmosphere in the first place. By the end of the century, we reduce emissions a tenth of a degree through these removals, 0.1 degree. That's really useful. Every tenth of a degree matters and really counts, but it's obviously not the whole solution by a long shot. So we have limited climate benefits from land-based carbon dioxide removals. Okay, so I'm going to move into um, 
the land gap report part now. This is sort of more straightforward, but I hope that science background helps to understand a bit what we're talking about when we talk about land and climate mitigation. So this was a report, as I said, released last November, just prior to the Egypt COP. We also had a side event at that COP, which, which in fact you can find online that was also recorded. And I'm showing the author list because a lot of people contributed to this report. So we had um, around 20 authors from different institutes in, I think it's five continents or something, I can't remember, but a lot of people, it was a big author team. Um, so it was a, a big effort. And what we did, this was the first report to assess how much land governments have included in their net zero pledges, as well as their NDCs, their um, pledges for 2030. So often, I'll go to the results. So we assess this in terms of land area. So governments don't always put this in land area. They might say in their pledge, we're going to um, remove five uh, million or 500 million tonnes, well, anyway, whatever scale it would be, 50 million tonnes of CO2 by 2030 through planting forests. But they don't say how much land that forest will take. Or there's even more, there's even vaguer commitments around um, uh, to do with agriculture, restoring a lot of agricultural land, um, it's it's mostly the the forest commitments though where often they won't mention how much land, and so no one ever knew. I mean, there's been a few assessments saying how much uh, CO two is removed will be removed if governments deliver all their pledges to remove CO two, but no one said how much land would that take. And I think this is really really important and the really concrete piece of information we need because we need to understand that when we talk about removing CO two into land, that 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 is an area of land and exists somewhere on the planet and people live on it, people use it. And we need to be sure that those plans to include it in climate mitigation strategies don't displace people or existing land uses such as food production. So what we found is 1184 million hectares required for land-based carbon dioxide removal in all country pledges for um, 2050 or 2030 if they didn't have a net zero pledge already. So this is all countries in the world we looked at um, not corporations or anything like that. Um, but what, I mean, there are a few different ways we cut this number up. Um, so that's 1.2, almost 1.2 billion hectares. Again, it's similar to global cropland. Uh, it's, um, I don't have these in front of me, but in the report, we sort of tried to say how big this was. So I think we said it's three and a half Indias. Uh, Australia, for example, is around 800 million hectares. So 1184 million hectares is bigger than Australia. Um, I think it's bigger than the continental US as well, but uh, these are all in the report and I forget. Um, okay, so one, one of the most important ways we split it up, in my opinion, is what of these pledges for land-based CDR relied on land use change and what which of them were restoring existing lands, existing ecosystems. So it's a... Not too far off half half, but a little more, 633 million hectares requires land use change. So this would be tree planting, um, plantations, a few did mention energy plantations, forest expansion, anything to do with reforestation or tree planting means that there's currently not trees on that land and you're going to put trees on there. Now that can be done well, it can be done with mixed species and in consultation with um, Indigenous peoples or local communities, but it often is done very badly. And then 551 million hectares for restoration. So this is when there's a forest already there, but it's degraded. And the country is saying they're going to restore that degraded forest, maybe by stopping logging it or removing whatever was degrading it. So it's already a forest. That, that's, it's good to restore degraded forests. Rangelands were mentioned a lot, particularly in a lot of developing countries, restoring degraded rangelands that have been overgrazed. Also mangrove restoration, wetlands, um, agroforestry and silver pasture are really important agricultural practices that bring more carbon into the land as well as increase productivity. So the land keeps being used for agriculture, but um, you actually get more productivity, more biodiversity, more car and carbon gets held in the soil. And the, it's basically more in, in actually in Victoria, it's always referred to as trees on farms. It's increasing the number of trees in farms while still farming. And it, it's a very broad practice, actually. It's done in a lot of really different ways in different places. So the graph, by the way, sorry, just shows um, the pledges by year. So many of this, much of this, um, maybe it's around half or slightly less, uh, a fair bit less actually, is pledged for 2030. Then a lot of the land pledges come out in the 2050 pledges and one country 
made one very large pledge of 200 million hectares for 2060. Um, so this is the graph that doesn't really work or the figure that doesn't really work, but I'll just try and explain to you what we have here in this red line is the planetary boundaries. So we're trying to put this scale of land use change that governments are, are pledging for climate mitigation in the framework of planetary boundaries. So that work um, by Will Stephan, who sadly recently passed, was at um, ANU in Canberra, one of Australia's or at Australia's most outstanding climate scientists. Anyway, um, he puts the that him and his team and that work on planetary boundaries put the boundary for permanent cropland at 1,300 million hectares. So I got it wrong before. That's the boundary, and current global cropland is estimated to be at 1,500 million hectares already. Now there's different estimates on this. It's not these are not exact figures, but we've already exceeded the planetary boundary for how much land we should have as permanent cropland. So what we're saying here is that this land use change in pledges, which depending how it's done, could be compared to cropland, uh, will take us even further in terms of planetary boundaries. While at the same time, this part here is saying um, these are projected these projections for the expansion in agriculture uh, by 2050 actually we may need um, up to 2100 hectares of land million hectares of land for agriculture or it could reduce by a third down to just um, uh, one just down to a billion hectares roughly depending on, on, on agricultural practices and diets and, and what we do. So also really important to think about how our agricultural and diet needs increase demand for land for agriculture or reduce it. And then over here is our land for restoration. Our, that's the rest of our results because they're not increasing demand for land. So a little awkward, but um, hopefully you get the point that it's um, about demand for land. Um, now, this report can be found on the website here, landgap.org, and there's also a what we call an interactive database. It's just a map, um, and you can click on the different countries and find out information about the pledge. So if we look here, I've clicked on Australia, um, and it, it shows you a few different things. So it shows you the land area required, and for Australia, I absolutely can't read that. I have, it's 27 million hectares, I'm pretty sure, when I did read it, when I could see. It's so small on my screen. Um, and that's for 2050. So that's in our net zero strategy that was put forward by Morrison a couple of years ago, and we hope gets improved radically and doesn't stand as an existing strategy. Anyway, the pledge method means did they pledge this as emissions or land area? And Australia pledged it as emissions, so we had to use our calculation thingies to work out how much land area that would be required. And um, it's an official pledge, as in it's a government pledge. Uh, the countries show the colours show that the pledge type is all land use change. So this, these yellows are all the same. It's just when you click on a country, the, the color fades a bit. So Australia has pledged 27 million hectares in land use change. Now we're over, over 800 million hectares. So we're a big country, but we only have 74 or 75 million hectares of agricultural land. So this is like a third of our agricultural land. That's a big problem. Uh, green means the country has pledged for restoration, such as Indonesia here. Actually, they made a huge pledge for forest restoration, which was really good. And um, brown would be both. Um, so you can see on the map different. So it's just a simple way to present the information. And some country pledges were very good. Some had not much information. Some were clearly very, very problematic. And Australia is a good leading example of that. And then um, I'm going to to start moving on but so we had other chapters in the report that's all calculating the land area then we had a chapter on um, primary forest and ecosystem restoration because that is so critical to not lose any further um, primary and native forests and we had a chapter on land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities and this graph figure uh, is just showing uh, there's a lot of things in it probably too many but one interesting thing is the um, this green sort of shaded area, that is um, primary forests globally. That's showing you where there still are primary forests. So they're also here in the Congo Basin across um, Indonesia and the tropical belt there and the boreal forests up in um, Russia and Canada. Uh, and if it was a higher resolution, there'd be a teeny, teeny few dots in Australia. Um, so it's, and 
then it's showing um, so it's showing primary forests, and then the shades of green show where there are um, the the percent of the country that is recognised as collectively held lands or um, um, indigenous indigenous lands. So Australia is relatively high. Um, the US, for example, is quite low. Uh, so it, we wanted to sort of show that there's an overlap between the extent of primary forests and um, in particular legal tenure and recognised tenure for Indigenous peoples. Uh, but we it, the, the data is actually very difficult to get on that. And so we couldn't sort of show that at a spatial scale, but at a sort of statistical country scale. And then the little pie charts, I think um, we've pulled out about 15 countries where we just show um, the proportion of land in the whole country because we didn't do that before uh, compared to their land pledge. So India, for example, has pledged something like two thirds of its land area. That's huge. Um, Australia has actually only pledged a small bit of its land area, as I said, but most of our land, we only, only a fraction of our land area is actually agricultural land and <clears throat> um, is wet enough to grow much in terms of trees. So it really differs between country and by context. Okay, so I'll move on pretty quickly with this slide. You can read it because I do need to get on to the, spend a few minutes talking about the policy implications. But um, these are our key messages from the Land Gap report. They're in the report, um, maybe slightly more detailed, but we consider this to be an unrealistic amount of land for carbon, for carbon removal in country climate strategies in aggregate. Some countries are fine and some countries are not. Uh, more than half of the total area pledged involves land use change, as I said, which puts more pressure on ecosystems, food security and indigenous people's rights. And net accounting assumptions assume that planting new trees offset emissions from fossil fuel or land use change, which ignores scientific and ecological principles. This is not, it's, it's not a scientifically agreed fact that trees can offset fossil emissions. It's actually the opposite. Uh, so. And securing land rights for Indigenous peoples and local communities has proven the most effective for preventing deforestation. This is detailed really well in the land rights chapter. And then we also have a chapter on agroecology and sustainable food systems, which really looks at how agroecology is a huge part of the solution because it's effectively it's bringing biodiversity into um, or all kinds of diversity, in fact, into agricultural systems. So um, that is the land gut report. I hope you've saved up your questions on that. And I'll just spend a couple of minutes, it won't, on Australia's climate policies, it won't take very long because we don't have many and the ones we have are terrible. Um, so Australia, the, when we, um, the new Labor government last year, is it already, it's only last year, um, updated our NDC. So NDC is nationally determined contribution. That's what all countries have to submit under the Paris Agreement. And ours had not been updated since, uh, I think it's probably 2013 or 2014, like when they were first submitted as sort of draft preliminary things before the Paris Agreement was even agreed. Tony Abbott submitted one probably 2014, hadn't been updated since then. So that's great. Australia got a big brownie tick in Egypt for updating its NDC, but it did take, um, what's that, seven, eight, eight, nine years. It's not, it's fairly, it's, it definitely makes us a laggard in um, global climate action. And we updated it to 43% emission, 43 emission reductions um, by 2030, which is also completely inadequate. Um, any scientific analysis shows Australia should be sort of around 75, 80% emission reductions by 2030. And that's also really important to keep in mind because people, I find this among my friends and family, people who don't follow this and aren't really knowing the science and are listening to the media, which is often biased, 43% sounds like a lot, particularly when we've updated that from, I think it was 24%. And we've just gone bang. We've almost, well, not quite doubled it, but 43% by 2030, that sounds like a lot. But to be in line with the science, to have any chance of meeting the Paris Agreement, we would need to be reducing emissions closer to 80%. And that is not disagreed or contested by any climate scientist. Um, so we're kind of hiding the scale of action that's required from the public when we don't be very clear about the figures and the, the ambition required. 
Uh, so Australia's NDC is fairly brief. It focuses on decarbonisation of energy and in industry sectors, which is good. Electric vehicles, batteries, grid stability. You, you've heard of some of the policies coming out from this, perhaps. And it, it doesn't have any focus so far on agriculture, which is also OK to start with because the, um, the priority is really um, decarbonising energy and industry. But in fact, there's sort of an, a backdoor sneaky underhand way that Australia is actually including the agriculture sector, land and agriculture in its climate policies. And this is the safeguard mechanism. So this has been on the news in the media a lot lately. And that's because parliament's currently debating this. They hope to have it, um, the government hopes to have it passed in the next few weeks. And there's been a lot of opposition to it and rightly so. So the safeguard mechanism, uh, again, actually, it's a leftover Tony Abbott policy that was never properly implemented. And now the government have reformed it to have a declining emissions baseline. So the there's facilities that are sort of major industrial polluters, uh, uh, the facilities that included under the safeguard mechanism. And if the idea is that the, uh, the baseline of what they're allowed to emit declines by 5% every year, that will put them in line with um, that 43, their share of the 43% target by 2050, sorry, 2030, um, which could in theory do, absolutely could. This is not, the, a lot, the EU has a system like this, um, the US, China, most countries have some kind of um, what we would call a trap and, tap and trade system where there's a cap here, the baseline is the cap on emissions from certain sector and then it declines. The problem with um, the government's proposal of the safeguard mechanism is it allows unlimited offsets. So there's obviously no cap if you can use unlimited offsets. So that 5% decline every year could just be met through um, buying offsets and the country, the company could not reduce its emissions at all. So that's unacceptable. And there is actually no other country, or in fact, someone has dug out that Kazakhstan has a cap and trade system with unlimited offsets, but they're the only country. Every other country has limits. And the EU um, since 2000, I'm pretty sure, has completely ruled out offsets. There are no offsets in its emissions trading scheme. Um, <clears throat> the second problem with it, I've only got three problems here, there are many, but we'd definitely be out of time, is offsetting permanent fossil fuel emissions, as I've explained in the science section, with temporary removals into land and forests, doesn't that, that doesn't work. There's no scientific basis for that. So there's no climate integrity to this idea of offsets at all, let alone unlimited offsets, if those offsets are coming from the land sector, which they mostly are in Australia. So this is going to be ACCUs, Australian Carbon Credit Units, and there was a review into those late last year, concluded in January, um, because there's a lot of concern about the integrity of these. They're mostly forest and agriculture projects and they have very low integrity. So agriculture is kind of brought into our climate policies by offsetting our most um, heavy industry polluters and fossil fuel um, man, uh, plants which is not really the way we should be dealing with agriculture and land sector. And then the final one is it allows new fossil fuel projects into the scheme. There are no government policies to address fossil fuel expansion. There is, um, you've probably seen in the media, over 100 um, new projects listed um, in the government's development plans. And the IPCC um, report, the last thing I'll say on it, is absolutely clear that there is no, in fact, I'll read it out, I did write it down here. It's clear that CO2 emissions from existing and planned fossil fuel infrastructure will take us to two degrees warming. That's the IPCC bit. Hen my bit is, hence, there's no new development should take place if we're committed to achieving the Paris Agreement. So it is not at all radical to say we should have no new coal and gas. It is in line with the science. It is completely in line with the report that was just released from all the world scientists. That's really our last warning. Um, so I'll put these up and um, stop talking, I think, because I'm a little bit over time. But they're fairly simple, my recommendations. We need to be phasing out fossil fuels immediately. We enhance the protection of ecosystems, separate out reductions and removals so we don't have this net zero accounting problem. And tree planning is not a climate strategy. So thank you very much for your time. Well, wow. you packed a lot in there, Kate, <laughs> and I can see there's quite a few questions coming up in the in the chat too. Then some of them are excellent questions. So I'm going to hand over now to you, Mick, for the first question to Kate. So 
So, look, um, yeah, there's a few of us been doing a fair bit on the safeguard mechanism. Um, so no new coal and gas. Uh, I mean, it's 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 an amazing report. There's a lot to digest. Um, and the fossil fuel industry obviously wants, you know, we want to do carbon capture storage. We want to do offsets. We want to do, they want to do everything but, you know, stop new oil and gas and start fate and decarbonising. So, um, but look, we've got some fascinating questions here. I'm going to start with the one from the Victorian context from Emma Chessel, who's with the Victoria Forest Alliance. Uh, Victoria and Tasmania both have large negative emissions accounted for as a sink from the Lulu, from the land use, land use change uh, and forest sector. So they've, they've got uh, large negative emissions accounted for. Are these accurate and meaningful, Kate? Does your work, have you looked down to, to that, that level in Vic Taz? And obviously we're in Vic Taz, so there's, and, and, and Emma's wanting to know about forests. So uh, got any comments on that? Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, but um, one thing I could say is in Victoria, like there's been a lot of research done on our um, temperate forests in Victoria. They're actually among the most carbon dense in the world and um, on par with um, sort of the Seattle area of the United States, that what's that, Pacific coast. Um, so there is a lot of work and that can be relatively accurate at sort of the forest stand level um, where people have gone out and measured forests and that has been done in Victoria, probably Tasmania as well. But the other thing to say is the, the land sector, so forests and land in general, is the most uncertain component of the global carbon budget. So um, there's a report released by scientists every year saying how much emissions, we, how much we've emitted, where... Uh, from all the different sectors and the land sector is the most uncertain. So um, it can be relatively um, reliable at that sort of local scale, but but there's still a lot of uncertainties there. Uh, the question is, is there enough land for agricultural enterprise and value change to offset its own emissions? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I would say yes. There's not a lot of work and research done on this. There was a really good report in New Zealand done that um, I'd probably recommend sending the link out to, to your audience. I can send it to you um, by the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment in New Zealand, which is sort of an advisory role, uh, modelling how they would do that in, in New Zealand. So the thing is, if you're only offsetting, um, and by the way, in that report, it was the biological emissions in agriculture. So <clears throat> not the fossil fuel part of agriculture, but if you're only offsetting biological um, emissions, then there's a lot less to offset, and there's a and the, therefore the land is available, um, and can be done in good ways, sort of a watershed level or farm scale, um, and you don't have this problem, this temporal problem of offsetting carbon that has been stored away for millennia with temporary forests because those biological emissions are also uh, on short time scales. Basically, I could go into that more, but it's it's definitely. The way I say is we should be going to zero fossil fuel and energy emissions and net zero agriculture and land. We've got another question here, which is strain context, Kate, which is that the CSIRO put out a report late last year. I think you might have mentioned that report, uh, estimating Australia's land-based sequestration potential. Um, so it's some sort of sounding, it's seeming like the questioner is saying that CSIRO put something out that was positive about land-based sequestration potential, are the CSIRO estimates right? That's the question. Yeah, the CSIRO estimates are based on um, a, a land use model that the Australian government uses and, uh, and, and economic modelling. So they're based on a carbon price point uh, where carbon might outvalue, the carbon sequestration into trees could outvalue other uses of land. So I think that's a very problematic way to look at it because other uses of land include um, growing food. Um, it, it would change the economics of, of agriculture sector. Uh, and the carbon price point from my memory was around $250 a tonne by 2050. So that's very high. And they also separate out um, 
they call them biodiversity plantings from carbon plantings and they assume that they being the model really the model assumes there's more carbon in the carbon plantings like just monoculture trees than in mixed species where you get more biodiversity but in fact if you understand anything about ecosystem integrity and ecological principles the carbon is more resilient and stays in the forest and the land if you have biodiversity so i think it's a problematic model and i don't agree with the results <laughs> okay thanks um this was an early question it came from grant and it's asking kate did your work consider available water su to support the re the required vegetation in um, any of your methods? So the Landgut report wasn't that, not that was not what we did, we just assessed government pledges. You might be talking about the paper I showed about halfway through the presentation where we estimated how much sequestration globally from ecosystem restoration. And no, we didn't uh, think about water in that. But with sort of the idea with um, restoring existing ecosystems is you've and not basically the idea of when you're not planting trees where trees wouldn't naturally grow, then you're not relying on water and other nutrient inputs. So that's why ecosystem restoration is better than tree planting. But you're quite right that a lot of these models, such as the Syro one, would require water input for some of that sequestration. Thanks. Kate, uh, it's not a specific question, but it's sort of a general theme and, and looking at one of your other, um, or listening to one of your other podcasts, you talk about uh, the flaw in the model of, of monos, monoculture, monospecies species forests, um, and some of the big bushfires that, are, um, that have been happening around the world. And when you look at through the prism of a monoculture, then they aren't, they're not resilient to fire. And, and we don't get the biodiversity outcomes. Can you sort of add maybe a little bit more about that, that topic, the difference between a monoculture forest and a, a multi-species? I might not have the uh, terminology perfect there, but um, can you just sort of expand a little more on that? Yeah. Uh, and there's no agreed terminology when it comes to forests. It's a massive global problem that every country defines forests however they prefer. Um, yeah, that's what I touched on before in terms of the CSIRO modelling. It's a big problem. It doesn't take that into, an, into account. So effectively, we need to think about ecosystem integrity when thinking about carbon in land or forest because it's ecosystem integrity that um, uh, which, um, which is based on biodiversity or biodiversity contributes to that um, is that maintains or allows the carbon to stay in that land or forest so as you degrade an ecosystem you lose carbon that can be out of soil out of trees um, and it also uh, the forest so you could have a, a monoculture plantation um, it's, there's no ecosystem integrity it's very degraded um, but the carbon's still there in the trees because they're standing there the carbon might be lose, lost out of the soils but um they're also far less resilient to stress to external stress. So heat waves, drought, um, insect attack, that sort of thing. Um, monoculture plantations are very, very susceptible. And we've seen this recently in Portugal, not even just recently, like for the last decade. Portugal keeps having these horrendous wildfires because they have huge areas of eucalyptus plantations and they're actually outlawing or banning eucalypt plantations there. Um, now, uh, and there's also a lot of research happening in Australia. A paper was just published, um, I just saw it yesterday, a new paper in WA actually, showing that um, undisturbed forests are more resilient to fires. So this is huge implications in Australia. And um, we really need to be, most of our ecosystems are degraded. We have some of the most highly degraded and, and high levels of biodiversity loss in the world. Degrading those ecosystems obviously is good for biodiversity and ecosystem services, but also makes them more resilient to climate change stress. Um, thank you. The, the next question is, uh, there's one about solar and wind renewables also competing for land with no forest. Um, Jeff was wanting to know, have you got any comments with regard to the competition within the land use? Mm. Um, yeah, there's a couple of studies that look globally at the, or well, they model out a, a transition to 100% renewables globally and how much land that would take. And 
I don't remember the numbers and it would actually be a good idea maybe to compare it with or use those numbers a bit in our land gap report as a comparison, but it's orders of magnitude less. Like there is not an, a, a concern with renewables taking up land that we don't have. There is enough land on the planet for renewables. There's definitely a concern around individual siting and making sure renewables are sited in the right places. And there's plenty of examples of them being put in the wrong places where they can still do social or ecological harm, but that's a different issue than just the sheer uh, expanse of land that would be required for them. Thanks. Thank Kate. you. Um, so, so I think this, this question is, is looking at whether there is merit in growing trees, Kate, and it's from Carolyn asking, because there is a lot of, um, a lot of enthusiasm, let's say, but cautious enthusiasm in, in our group and some people that have been going up into, you know, out out uh, out to the northeast of Melbourne, out out in out in that area around Buchan and and some of those areas that are agricultural um, but underutilised. And and do you think that there is, you know? Where, where where where's the sweet spot? Where, where are the places that that agroforestry could be made to work? Or, or, or and and coming back then maybe to the distinction between agroforestry and um, uh, restoration. And you know you've got that intersect between the indigenous and the community. But putting the indigenous community to to kind of to one side is is there is there um, is there that the possibility of of gaining gaining some good if it was done properly? Um, yeah, no, thank you very much for this question. It's a really important question, and and to, that I um, communicate this this right. There absolutely is merit to growing trees, the right tree in the right place, basically. And agroforestry is a really good example of um, the right tree in the right place because it's integrating trees into farmlands. Uh, which is how agriculture was done more traditionally. Uh, there's different methods of agriculture, of agroforestry um, for different places. It, it's a term that covers a very, very broad range of practices. Um, but when I said, like in my, my final point, my conclusion slide is tree planting is not a climate solution or something like that. And I should have been more specific. It's not a climate mitigation solution. Like, mm. To mitigate climate change, to hold warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees, we need to stop, um, we need to reduce fossil fuel emissions to zero, like we need to phase out fossil fuels by the middle of the century. Um, agroforestry and trees and a lot of positive practices that we can do on land are a really, really important climate adaptation solution. And one of the other good things about the <clears throat> IPCC synthesis report that was just released is they really put all of these practices much more on the adaptation side, like literally of the graphic. There's a, a great, uh, there's a lot of good um, graphics in there. People are debating whether they're infographics or, or figures or sort of scientific figures, but there's a lot of effort has been put to communicate the language well. So I would encourage people to look at it. And there's one really good graphic that shows um, on one side, all of the mitigation strategies and their cost and their potential. And on the other side, um, adaptation strategies. And most of these things that I would say are good practices in the land sector are highlighted in the adaptation side. And that's where I think they should be. Relying on them for mitigation is risky. And there's just like, th there is some small mitigation value as I showed in my, um, in my paper, a 10th of a degree by the end of the century. And that's not nothing. Um, but what we tend to get when we value um, tree planting and land practices for mitigation is a focus on carbon that devalues all of the other important aspects of trees, of agriculture, of agroforestry. And that focus on carbon incentivizes things like monoculture. It incentivizes things like the CSIRO's um, land use model that, that sees biodiversity as lower carbon than, than just fast growing trees. Um, and just to go briefly, Mick, to your question, to your point about um, the diff diff different definitions, 
Um, I mean, agroforestry, and there's sort of overlaps and, and you can slice the pie in different ways, I guess, but agroforestry is trees integrated into farming lands. Silver pasture is increasing trees and shrubs on grazing lands and usually requires reduced stocking rates, whereas agroforestry done in the right way can actually improve um, agricultural productivity, providing wind breaks, uh, increasing carbon in the soil, which is obviously what farmers really need, uh, increasing water retention and things like that. Then restoration. So I actually put agroforestry and silver pasture under the idea of agricultural regeneration or restoration. They're, they're agricultural methods that regenerate farmlands. Um, then when you sort of have ecosystem restoration where you have maybe a degraded natural ecosystem and you remove whatever's degrading it, and then you have reforestation, which is planting a new forest. So there's... I've got one short question, um, which may or may not have a, a short answer. Have any major emitters challenged the land gap report this is from jeff uh thanks jeff that's a great question and no one's asked that yet and we were actually really nervous before it came out that that um, countries would challenge it because part of the point of the report is we're saying governments are very intransparent about what they're relying on in the land sector and we've had to make a lot of assumptions and do a lot of calculations to suggest how much land they're relying on and we could have got it wrong but the point is that they should be making it much more explicit, not only how much land, but where that land is and how they're going to consult about it and who they're going to consult, et cetera. Um, no, nobody's challenged us. Um, and in particular, we're worried about Saudi Arabia because they have a massive, massive tree planting pledge that we highlighted. But I guess the one thing is the reports mostly in aggregate. We don't discuss individual countries. We have that data and we put the data on the website. So anyway. We'll be, we'll be ramping it up the next few years to see if we can get anyone to challenge us. There's a question here on the Chubb report and just to sort of fill people in, a lot of people will know the Chubb report looked at the um, integrity basically of the, the ACUS Australian Carbon Credit Unit scheme and whether the scheme was, was working in a whole range of ways and the report was presented back just before Christmas and sort of basically, I think, said nothing to see. The question is, what's your response, Kate, to the findings of the Chubb report on the integrity of carbon offsets? Um, yeah, the the Chubb, the, the final report from the Chubb review was very disappointing. Um, the, it, it was such, obviously, a review into the integrity of these carbon offsets was really needed, and it was great that Labor had that as um, an election promise and acted on it straight away. The time frame was um, a bit rushed, more rushed than it needed to be, and it's really hard. Then the review came out with no major recommendations to change anything. They've changed a few there's re recommendations to change a few methodologies, but the number, the problem, one of the problems with Australia's emissions offsets scheme, whatever you want to call it, because it keeps changing name, but um, is most of the offsets are generated under just a few methodologies, and those are the methodologies that have been called into question for integrity. So while the Chubb Review has um, recommended some changes to those methodologies, existing projects will continue using those flawed methodologies for years. And I think, so Andrew McIntosh and his colleagues at ANU have done analysis of this. I think they're coming out with around 40% of credits will still be unchanged under the, the same problems that were called out before the Chubb Review. Uh, so that's disappointing and it's hard, to, It's I tried, like a lot of people engaged in this review and it's really hard to not see it as a box ticking exercise to validate offset credits before they put out the safeguard mechanism reform. Okay, so now this is a question from, from Ray. Uh, have you had the opportunity to share your findings with Chris Bowen and do you think the government understands the problems with relying on offsets but are ignoring them? <laughs> Thank you. That's a creative question. Um, so no, I haven't shared my findings with Chris Bowen. Um, he hasn't asked for them. <laughs> to, I, and on the second part of the question, uh, I really, I have to say, I really, really don't know. And this applies not only to um, Minister Bowen or the government, or um, it applies to so many of Australia's industry leaders and, and policymakers. 
do they understand the problems with offsets and are ignoring them or do they not understand? And in fact, this is to some degree my research focus for the next few years to, to try and work this out. I, I don't know what the answer to that is at this stage. Thanks, keep, keep working. <laughs> it's a good challenge for us as well to um, advocate and campaign I think the Chubb report got rushed through, as as you said, Kate, I'm not sure. Well, I kind of think it was rushed through ahead of the safeguard mechanism legislation. I think that was the mandate. But maybe we need to bring the Chubb report back into a bit more focus um, with some of some of this work. Um, got a question here on water availability. Kate, did your work consider available water to support? No, we did that one. We've done that one? Sorry, I must have goofed off. Um, all right, I've got another one here, which is the evidence shows that Indigenous people and communities with secure land rights vastly outperform government and private landholders in preventing deforestation, conserving biodiversity, producing food sustainability, so all the things we want to see. Can you expand on, 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 that, on those findings? Um, and what, what does that mean for, for people like us, climate change campaigners? Um, I guess, first of all, what, what, is, what is the evidence? How, how did you go about through or finding, or how did you find that Indigenous people and local communities vastly outperform other, other sectors, mm -hmm. government and private? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that chapter of the report, the, the results of the report I presented to you in terms of the land in uh, the hectares of land and government climate pledges, that's the only sort of new research and findings in the report. The rest are literature reviews or literature synthesis, which is the same as what the IPCC is doing. Um, so the chapter on land rights was written, was uh, the lead author is, is a leading researcher on um, Indigenous people's land rights um, globally. And effectively, that statement is based on decades of research that shows that in different places. Um, and you could go into this more and more detail. And, and if you're really interested in it, I do recommend reading that chapter because it's, um, it's, a, it's a review of, of literature on this topic from really the last decade or two. And it's put together by a team of authors who are very, very highly specialized in that area. So you'll learn a lot from reading that chapter. Um, but Basically, most of a lot of the research is in um, in Latin America, in Amazon countries and Southeast Asia. There's less research in Africa, and there's a small amount of research in Australia. And it, it looks at individual areas, and then um, uh, I'm forgetting the word, but it just sort of adjusts for things like remoteness. So if you have um, area um, with um, native tenure title and it's it's very remote from any road, then you might say, oh, well, there's no disturbances here, but it's because it's remote from a road. So adjusted for those kinds of factors as well. And um, many, many studies. So this is based on a lot of research studies that show biodiversity and carbon values and effectively nature protection values are higher in these areas where land tenure is secure in particular, but also where um, land is collectively governed. In terms of what it means for us or what, what can we do with this, I think Australia is already very much moving in the right direction. We're so, we're increasing the recognition of First Nations people and First Nations land practices. There's been a lot of discussion in Victoria about learning from First Nations in terms of um, fire management. And so there's basically just a lot of um, Indigenous knowledge that could be brought into how we manage lands. And that's how, how that could benefit um, more areas of land, as well as, uh, by the, sorry, as well as the really urgent need to recognise land rights where they exist. So there's um, Indigenous and peoples and local communities like collectively held lands cover more than half the land surf world's land surface but only about 10% of those are formally recognised. So really important step forward is more formal recognition of land rights. Wow, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is from Julia. Apart from preserving remaining native forests, what are the best ways for Australia to restore its biodiversity and ecosystem integrity? Are there positive land use changes we can make? Um, yeah, another great question, um, and I'm, I'm glad you sort of started with the caveat at the start because preserving our remaining native forests is of absolute utmost most importance. We don't get those back. 
um, when we destroy them. So other um, priorities, uh, well, I think that's the restoration of, of the degraded ecosystems that I see as the highest priority. And whilst we can't restore, I mean, maybe over a few hundred years, it really depends on the forest type, you can get to sort of like a native forest again or characteristics of a native forest. Um, but yeah, the, and Australia has huge potential for ecosystem restoration of degraded forests because we are still native forest logging. I think we might be the only um, sort of developed country or um, sort of advanced global economy that is still logging native forests. Um, or, or certainly on the scale that we are. So stopping logging those means immediately the trees start to regrow, the carbon accumulates, biodiversity um, it comes back. So that that's the absolute, like protecting what's already not disturbed. And in fact, there's sort of a well-known um, hierarchy in, in land management, protecting what's already not disturbed, restoring and regenerating anything uh, degraded lands, and then sustainable management of lands that are for productive use. And so there'll still be forests that are logged. Ideally, they'd be, um, yes, and thank you, it is the United, UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Um, so ideally, only plantation forests would be logged, and that would require a step change in how we use timber and how we think about timber. There's enough plantation forests in the world for timber supply if we use timber differently than we do now. Um, so yeah, protect, restore, and then sustainable use. Thank you. Uh, I want to just thank everyone for putting in these fantastic questions. It's quite a technical subject, but the standard of the questions and the answers is just just amazing. So thanks to everyone. Um, I'm just torn between a couple of questions. I'm going to ask this one. What do you think about biodiversity credits? Kate? Um, Is that something you're... Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not working closely on it now, but it, so it has, I mean, it has the same, same kind of underlying... I mean, the same sort of fundamental design flaw, I guess, as carbon offsets, but different physical process or reason underpinning it. Um, so biodiversity offsets are a problem because of the irrecoverable nature of much um, biodiversity. So if you're talking about um, an ecosystem such as a primary forest, it once it's lost, we never regain it. And so saying that we can somehow offset the biodiversity loss by having biodiversity protected somewhere else is, um, it, it goes against those principles and that understanding. And particularly at the state we are at in the planet with um, with uh, native primary ecosystem loss, I can't remember the statistic in the top of my head, sorry, but we have, you know, I mean, Australia is, is a classic example. We've lost so much of our original forest cover and our original um, habitats that there is nothing left to offset further destruction against. Like we're just too, it's it's too late. We have to protect everything that remains. And so there's no, I don't, yeah, I just, not, not a workable idea. Yeah, well, I'm gonna jump in there, uh, Mick and Jan. I, I know that we haven't got through all the questions. That's always the way. Almost. Um, thank you, both of you. You've done a great job at going through them. Um, I I am in awe, um, Kate, of your work, and I'm sure all of us feel the same. Um, and we could, this meeting could go on for much longer. But um, yes, we should read the report. Um, thank you for uh, reminding us uh, to do that, because I think that sometimes uh, we don't we don't do the follow up that we that we should do. So um, there's a it's clear that we do need to read, uh, particularly that chapter you mentioned on Indigenous um, uh, work and success. Um, I'd like to thank you very much. And it appears to me that the net in net zero must not distract um, from emissions reduction. That should be the focus and it should be now. I think that's one of the key takeaways for me. And also I wrote down another one that ecosystem restoration and keeping existing forest ecosystems healthy is also incredibly important. Um, in appreciation, Kate, and on behalf of the Lighter Footprints community, we are sending you this lovely book by David Lindemeyer, The Great Forest. Um, 
in the book, it describes itself as a voyage through time and across landscapes from the canopy to the forest floor. And we know that you will love it. Everyone, please join me now in thanking.